Good morning, Zoology 2700 enthusiasts. Another snow day this year, a strange one. Um, I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you're getting ready and feeling comfortable and confident about your lecture exam and your lab exam. You'll be fine. We're going to keep going today uh, to make sure that we get to talk about all of the diversity of mollusks, and we're going to talk about three groups today. We're going to talk about the monoplacophorans, the aplacophorans, two uh, kind of odd groups, not very diverse, but with some neat stories to tell and some neat adaptations to share. And then we're going to get started on the gastropods, ones that you're a group of mollusks that you're very familiar with, and an incredibly diverse and successful group that has a long and deep evolutionary history. So before we get going, I just wanted to call attention to this article that came out last week uh, that you can find in the PDF, the link to the New Yorker, that talks about Rosebud the whale and the diversity of creatures uh, that colonize her, including the Ozodex and the lidworms that we spent a lot of time talking about. So up for today, we're going to be talking, finishing talking about the gastropods here and here. We're going to talk about monoplacophorans and the aplacophorans. And a reminder that when we're dealing with the eight groups of the mollusks, that we're talking a lot of the time about functional adaptations of three different uh, parts of their morphology, that modifications of the foot, of the mantle, um, so the foot here, so you can see, so like a grasping uh, anchor and a root, as you would see in the bivalve, to a slowly creeping um, monoplacophorin or a slowly creeping polyplacophorin or a rapidly creeping gastropod or a highly mobile uh, and uh, predatory raptoral uh, cephalopod. Same part of the body radically different adaptations resulting in radically different uh, use of their environment. So the shell as well, different uh, ampli amplifying the importance of this shell from the simple kind of shield or the multiple shields or the coiled shield that we'll talk about or these kind of valved shields or a very, very reduced kind of a tiny shield like we, we see with the cephalopods. And then finally, the mantle, this incredible organ, this uh, part of the body wall that is secreting the shell, but can then also be involved in um, respiration, just incredible adaptations. So another reminder about the state of phylogenetics within the mollusks. So the mollusks, remember, within the dun phylogeny, we're within the spiralians, so we're talking about bilaterian, uh, bilaterally symmetrical organisms. And each one of these, these groups of mollusks, we have um, generally very deep and long fossil histories associated with the shells and, the, um, and that they fossilize well. And we have next to no dispute about the identity or the existence of any one of these groups, but the relationships between them are still a matter of active, active research. So the first group that we're going to talk about today are these up here, the kind of least mollusk-like uh, of any of the groups, the solenogastrias and the caudophavates, or we'll call them together the aplacophorans. So A without plakoff shield. So without shield, so the very worm-like now uh, mollusks. It would be a mistake uh, to consider them to be an ancestral form of mollusk. And you can see here in this cacao phylogeny that we've talked about several times that complements the one in your text, that they occur here as a sister group to the polyplacophorans and not ancestral at all, or not, not early branching at all. So this lack of, this is a very vermiform or worm-like group, and we think now that the loss of the shell is a secondary trait. So they're not a very diverse group, and this is part of the reason that um, We'll talk about why that is, but we don't think there's a lot of species. We know we have names for about 300 different species. They tend to be carnivores or deposit feeders, vermiform or worm-like, cylindrical. They're fairly small. The longest are about the kind of a, um, a ruler, about 30 centimeters, uh, a very reduced foot. So we talked about major adaptations for mollusks that you have a, an incredibly, uh, that you have shell and that you have a foot. And in each case, the aplacophorans are the least mollusk-like. These these major, these secondarily, these apomorphies seem to have been lost. 
They're marine, and they're often deeply marine in the abyssal zone. And so what we know about them, we don't know from direct observations. We know from uh, sifting through mud on the decks of ships as, we, as, as uh, deep hauls are made and the muck is brought up and dumped on. So, we've, so we have to infer a lot of things about aplicophorans. So worm-like. Um, you can see here this one apomorphy, this pedal groove. This seems to be uh, a part of the reduction of the foot. They're cylindrical, long and extended. The mantle does have these argonite spicules in, embedded in the cuticle, but there's no, um, but there is no shell per se. Uh, the caudophyvates of the two groups of aplicophorans, one of them seems to burrow in the sand more frequently, and the solagasters, about which we know even less, uh, can live not just in the sand or 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 in the in the substrate of the marine environment but they live a somewhat parasitic life in the in the long um, branches and tentacles of cnidarians so no outer shell um, and they this pedal groove here instead of a foot they lack extensive digestive cica and a reminder that they're not considered even um, they're not considered an ancestral form at all. They're mostly hermaphrodites, uh, although that some of the ketomorphs are gonochoric, and they do all have this characteristic trochophore larva with the mustache-like prototroch across the center band um, that is characteristic of all of the mollusks. So as I said, carnivores and deposit feeders, uh, a bipartite radula, Pedal groove, small mantle cavity, and here you can go and watch this YouTube video lit for yourself later on to see in all of its splendor an inching aplicophorin moving across a microscope slide. So before we leave them, though, I think one um, one thing to say or one common theme that we've seen throughout the course is that these deep abyssal zone uh, organisms that we feel or that we know very little about, we know very little about their diversity. We're discovering now more and more about their diversity because the two kind of major technological advantages that you have, the advantage that your generation of biologists has as an advantage, the deep ROV with slurp gun sampling and genetics and genomics that can be applied to the samples that they bring back up to the surface. So as these two tools are being applied uh, to the aplicophorans, we're just we're learning more and more about them. So I feel that this is one of these groups that for those of you that eventually teach this class, this is a group that will expand and take up more of our time in the future as we learn more about them. So the next big group that we're going to jump to in this polytomy of, of uh, molluscan diversity is the conchiferans or the shell bearing uh, so monoplicophorans, the bivalves, the scaphopods, gastropods, and cephalopods. So most of these are groups, or three of the five of them, are groups that you're probably familiar with. So bivalves, bivalve mollusks, uh, snails, and squid, octopus, those kinds of organisms. We're going to start out, though, by talking about some of the um, monoplicophorans. So the conchiferans here is a supported group where the contemporary or contemporary phylogenies tend to support this group, that the, the shell-bearing mollusks, with the exception of the polyplicophorans, do form this monophyletic grouping. So all the mollusks except the aplicophora and the polyplicophora, and the apomorphies for the conchiferans then include that there is a one-piece shell with the periostracum and the calcareous layers, so those different kind of strata of the of the shell. That the mantle margins has three folds. There's a crystalline style that the stiff mass in the stomach that that uh, that that moves the di the digestive process along. The mantle spicules are absent. Those are the things that we do see within the aplicophorans. And they're characterized by eight pairs of dorsoventral pedal retractor muscles. So this group that I mentioned, we talked about aplicophorans. We're now going to talk about the monoplicophorans. We don't actually see them in this uh, cocktail phylogeny. And that's partially because they're also very deep uh, sea-dwelling abyssal zone creatures. And... Contemporary collections, particularly ones that have been made with an eye towards DNA work, have been rare and hard to come across, and so they don't actually occur in this phylogeny. And one of the um, 
in a, a nature paper of 2011, there was even kind of a, a, a radical hypothesis that the monoplacophorans might be sister to the cephalopods. This is a, we'll see. As you can see in the, uh, in your text here, they're contained, the hypothesis within this po this polytomy of the, of the conchiferans, but their position relative to the other mollusk groups tends to bounce around. And this has a lot to do with some strangeness in their morphology. There's, there's a very, they're a very unique molluscar group. We'll talk about um, some of the apomorphies that characterize them. Uh, and also, as I said, they're very hard to collect and we've run into them literally very infrequently through time. So monoplacophora, if you derive the name, bearing of one plate, we knew a lot about them uh, up until 1952 only from Cambrian and Devonian fossils. And so when there was a dredge or a hull made in 1952 where a living monoplacophoran was discovered, this is generally thought of as one of the greatest zoological discoveries of the 20th century. So the, the as I've talked, as we've talked together about um, an ancestral um, mollusk, and I've shown this kind of simple cross-section of a shell, that may look, uh, or that that's uh, that drawing that Rupert Fox and Barnes made, is largely like, it looks grossly similar to a monoplacophoran, but we don't think that they are ancestral, just like we don't think that the aplacophorans are ancestral. So they're univalved and pseudo-segmented in this metameric serial repeti uh, repetition of the organs that you can see here. You can see different nephridia and gills um, and muscles lined up in almost segmented, like you would see with the annelids, fashion. This is, this is unique amongst the mollusks. No gastric shield, no head. It's a bilaterally symmetrical shell that varies in shape for the species, for the several dozen species that we know of, um, extant species, from a flattened shield to a short cone. And prior to 2017, this is kind of all we talked about with the monoplacophorans, the um, ancestral like, but not, uh, and we know very little about them. That changed about a, two years and one day ago uh, when one of these remotely operated vehicles sending high quality data and video images back to the surface that was streaming loud, the Ekonos um, submarine, was diving off of Yutua in Samoa in the, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean at about just under 4,000 meters deep. And they found and they came across these small aberrant mollusks so still not sure what causes this and given the low rates of seems to be at the end of the uh, trail, sedimentation yeah. in this area it's uh, it's likely that once this track so what they're doing right now is they found these grazing patterns see the dark Oops, sorry, but yeah, I'm trying to image the around to on object. This small Seems object of biological origin, but I can't this really identify as anything This was an exciting thing. We watched this live, and this is the rediscovery. This is the first documented. The only round things that come uh, to mind like that are the emerging. Oh, Just wait to get and see into better focus. That yeah, video, come out real quick. Let me try to. And what's kind of happening is they're zooming in oh, the this is a lot of observation. We've been so there's puzzling the on over the, deck the origin or, of or these trails. The ROV, but there's also live connected uh, scientists from around the world who are looking at this small disk. But look at this, these little clumps of sediment. So you can maybe it's scouring up the sediment and so digesting it. They scouring up the sediment, as they just say. Or but they get somehow kind of see the shell is somewhat transparent, and there's evidence. Pops no idea what it is. Oh, oh, evidence of this serial repetition. Good eyes. The ROV teams bought this one. Less precarious. They what is this? Very excited. Oh, yeah. so just like we watched this in the trail of being discovered by the shell. It does. It looks like a shell. 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 It
the first monoplacophron that had never been seen before. So this was February 2017, and in March 2018, the scientific team from that expedition published this observation and included the, some of the video that you just saw and then diagrams of the mollusk and the grazing pattern here. But one of the things, um, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, they talked about, they flipped one of them over. And even at that 4,000 meters deep, you can see the serial repetition of the nephridia and the gills. So even um, on the deck of that ship, these very restrained scientists were, were looking at this somewhat transparent moss and going, this is kind of crazy. This is this is a new new observation, new new discovery of, of seeing a monoplacophron uh, in the wild for the very first time. So... Finally, this morning, uh, we're going to introduce, start to introduce you to, we go from um, not very diverse groups to not very understood groups, the monoplacophrons, to a very well documented in the fossil record and in contemporary uh, biology across the world, successful, uh, the, ga the gastropod mollusks. So some of the ones that have um, enormously, uh, great enorm enormous success across the marine environments, freshwater, aquatic environments, and even the terrestrial environments. So compared to 300 odd species that we talked about earlier with the aplacophrons, and fewer than 100 species of monoplacophrons, more than 70,000 species of gastropods. Some of them like, like these sea hares, like terrestrial kind of mollusks, and even shellless, predatory, um, swimming uh, pteropods. Avomorphies for the for the gastropods uh, include torsion. Talk about the uh, an asymmetrically coiled shell uh, with an anterior mantle cavity, an operculum, and the loss of a gonad and of a gill. So to start out, as we talk about the um, mollusks, I'm going to give you a recipe. So a recipe for mollusks. So some uh, escargot. And to say, to make a mollusk, to make a gastropod out of a mollusk, we need to do several steps here. You need to elongate the shell to make space for a portable retreat into which the organism can pull itself. You need to coil up this shell in two different ways, planispirally and conospirally. You need um, to do the conospiral coiling, you need some asymmetry. There's going to be torsion and that's going to result in flexure of the gut. And there's some consequences to those final two bullets. So we'll talk about each one of these uh, to end today's uh, discussion. So the first thing, in gastropod mollusks, the shell and the visceral mass twist into this spiral. This results from differential um, growth on two sides of the shell, so that starts to produce the spiral. This is different than um, other mollusks, and that coiling is different than torsion, and it probably preceded it. So when you're coming back and revisiting these lecture notes later on, remember that coiling of the shell and torsion of the body mass are two different processes. So the coiling uh, essentially allows an extreme elongation of the shell without it being a large deterrent to movement. So the first way that, that we're going to coil our shell, that we're going to increase the capacity to move around here, is a planispirally coiling. So just one on top of its other. So each whorl follows the same angle, but is successfully, successfully larger. So the spiral diameters were required they increase in size and they're required to accommodate a relatively large increase in the mass, the biomass of the, of the, of the body cavity of the mollusk. So the shell volume, by doing it like this, the shell volume is increased and it also creates a hollow retreat into which the organism can pull itself. So it's to increase in size again and again and again with an ever increasing diameter isn't super compact and it becomes at some point hard to move. So the pro of planar spiral coiling is that you have a retreat created, so a larger shell than just the cone down here into which you can pull your body. And the con is that if you keep going with this coiling larger and larger, you eventually have an impediment to movement. The way the gastropods have solved this 
is to twist the, the cone, uh, the spiraling. So this is um, a look down um, on top of a plantar spirally coiled shell that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what happens is that the there's two parts to being uh, conospirally. So it's like you roll up a, a tube or a, a piece of paper, and then you take the interior bit of that roll and you pull it out. And that's what's happening here with the spire. Now, if you were just to do that, you uh, end up tilting over, being unbalanced. So when it's extended to the right, so the asymmetrical gastropod shell Kona spirally one is then shifted at about 45 degrees. So just like you kind of hike your um, backpack over one particular shoulder, and the result of this is you've increased and made a retreat, and then you've tilted it and made possible um, even larger, um, an even larger shell and a, and more motion or a better capacity to move with that large increased shell size. So. Spiraling with the shell, differentially laid down on, on the outside, so it creates that spiral, is different than torsion. And torsion is what happens, it's a synapomorphy for the gastropod, and it occurs during larval development for all of the gastropods. So it's the rotation of the body mass. So you can see here on the left-hand side, this is kind of the ancestral um, direction. So we've got a mouth and a gut. And then just as we saw with that uh, hypothetical ancestral mollusk, we have um, an anus and then out an osphradium and out into the back end of the body. So torsion is going to rotate this so that the gill is then pointing forward. And strangely, the anus is then kind of pointing at the mouth and is still on top of the gill. So this flexure of the gut, this bend, then brings it forward. So torsion, there's some problems associated with torsion, and it's not entirely clear what the, the advantages are, but we have some hypotheses that we'll discuss. So first we'll talk about some of the, the consequences of bringing the mantle cavity and anus to an anterior position above the head. One of the consequences, first of all, is that uh, in comparison to a pretty straightforward monoplacophorin neural network. So the streptorous um, uh, fairly just linear uh, and simple neural network is then twisted and complicated in a gastropod because of the torsion of the body. And there's then also the conflict of um, sanitation and ventilation. So we have uh, this an asymmetrical one of the solutions here is that we have an asymmetrical mantle cavity so you can see this gift that I've made of the of some figures figure 13 from your brusca text doc follow that torsion where the anus is brought forward and then now points directly up over the mouth so in some mollusks like on the top here this pretty simple limpet gastropod the mouth, which is in the center right here, they still have bipectinate gills. And so water is brought in from two sides laterally and passes on top of the anus, just above the mouth, and then exits through a center hole. Many and more complicated plana and conospirally coiled gastropods have lost one of their gills. So there's not a bipectinate, there's a monopectinate solution. That's what the two arrows here are pointing at. And then this asymmetrical, by losing one of the gills, the arrangement in the body is now asymmetrical. So that permits water to enter on one side of the body, pass over top and through the gills, and then leave on the other side of the body. So functionally, uh, losing that gill and nephridium on the right-hand side, that asymmetrical mantle cavity now allows the separation of ventilation and um and fouling. So this laterna, this curled shell here, this is an asymmetrical mantle cavity with the gills flowing into one side and the other. Um, it's also somewhat, it also has some changes in the mantle cavity that we'll talk about on Friday, where the mantle is vascularized and creates a functional lung. And then we have a more simple strategy with the limpet that has these two um, 
an, uh, a pour on the very top of the shell so that there's two lateral flows of water up over top and again so avoiding fouling that way so how do you make snails it's a very simple recipe in this class that doesn't involve butter. So you elongate the shell to make a, a portable retreat. You spiral your shell in two ways. You plan it and conospirally. You tort the shell, tort the body, excuse me. That results in a flexure of the gut, and you help solve that by losing some structure and developing an asymmetry. So an asymmetry of the shell and conospiral, and an asymmetry of the body in the torsion and the loss of, uh, of gills and nephridium. We talked about torsion. We said why there's <clears throat> four different. There's no clear reason why torsion has been so successful with the gastropods or via the gastropods. There's some uh, some of the hypotheses include the fact that because we have now, even though it's a complication of of the body and that makes the organism resolve and have to deal with this problem of ventilation and fouling that there's just associated benefits that you can move much better. If you're a, a creeping foot driven gastro uh, gastropod, you're moving a lot more than many of the other creeping um, mollusks. So this is a, we, we saw the polyplacophrin moving before the reading break. And that's, that's a very, sl that's, that was a very aberrant polyplacophrin. It was moving quite a bit. You can watch snails move. I mean, they're, they move slowly, but for a creeping mollusk, they move quite quickly. And we think that might be because of torsion. One of the other advantages is that the osphradium, remember the osphradium that I said, it was a little kind of a hanging organ that was testing the, the quality of the water that hangs underneath the gills. There might be the advantage to torsion might be that that essentially that chemical test, instead of being faced to the back end of the body, when you've torted it, it's now facing into the water that you're entering instead of the water that you're leaving. And so the benefit to torsion may be that that chemical sensor is now pointing the direction that you're going instead of the where you've been. Anterior facing uh, the, the lungs may just provide better ventilation for, for the gills. Uh, and one of the other adaptations uh, with an operculum that we'll describe uh, a little bit in greater detail on Friday is that torsion uh, lets you, as you retract into your as into the shell, if this is the, the head of the organism, instead of the foot being pulled in first, torsion means that it's the head that retracts first. And there may be the advantages that that um, as you retreat into your into your shell, into that protective body, that more often than not protecting the head first is a good way to go. So why torsion? It's not clear. These are some of the hypotheses. So again, the mantle within mollusks being one of the things um, that can seemingly become one of a morphological feature that can seemingly become anything. Uh, we'll talk about here about a siphon, which is a portion of the mantle skirt on the left hand side. Uh, so this, since we're talking about values of torsion, potential benefits of torsion being that it, in, it increased ventilation, this even the mantle or the, the, the adaptation of the mantle called the siphon improves that ventilation even further because it allows you to look or it allows the gastropod to kind of look in front of it and select the water that um, it's allowing into the body. So different parts of the shell, uh, the columnar was in the... Um, and the last of the columna, that center part of the swirl. And then breaking down into the cross section that we've got a proteinaceous out, outer layer of shell called the periostracum, this prismatic layer uh, of brick layer that are laid down perpendicular to the surface called the ostracum, uh, and then a plywood or a supportive layer called the hypostracum, and a nacerous layer uh, or a mother of pearl layer. We'll talk a little bit on Friday <clears throat> with a specific example about how uh, different different structural elements uh, that are involved here in these different layers. We talked a little bit before with the polyplacophrins, and we'll talk further uh, with some uh, gastropod examples on Friday. What are our words? And then finally, this is the last kind of bit, within gastropod diversity and linking gastropods, which we know are very diverse, to aplacophorins and monoplacophorins, which we think are not very diverse, but our understanding of the diversity is hindered by how deep they are, how deep they live. We're still discovering elements of their of diversity within the gastropods also associated with living in these deep, deep abyssal zones that cover the majority of the surface of our planets. And one of them I'm going to make a link to the Game of Thrones. What are our words?
our words. We do not sow. We do not sow. We are ironborn. We're not subjects. We're not slaves. We do not plow the fields or toil in the mine. We take what is ours. Miserable bunch of people, the Greyjoys. So they are. Um, I'm, the link I'm going to make to Discovery in the Abyssal Zone and the Game of Thrones and the Greyjoys is through or via this hot vent gastropod recently discovered living outside of thermal vents that creates its shell not just through calcium carbate derived from the water, from the from the water, the seawater around it, but from iron sulfides, iron associated with those thermal vents. So this is essentially a gastropod that's making its shell out of iron. And this is a skeletal material that, that is known from no other metazoan across the world. And so deep sea diversity previously not anticipated or understood, a new adaptation, the creation of shells from iron sulfide and not just calcium carbonate. So an iron shell and the Game of Thrones, the Greyjoys, their sigil is another invertebrate, another mollusk even, the Kraken, and that deep sea shell discovery of the gastropod making its shell out of iron. So ironborn, they're using essentially the wrong sigil. This should be the sigil, not the Kraken, but the deep sea gastropod. So a scaly foot gastropod uh, that you can read about here. So you're preparing for your exams, your newly rescheduled uh, lab exam and the lecture exam. And I just want to offer up uh, a suggestion that uh, that you keep plowing on, that it'll be fine. There's lots to know. There's lots to link together. Think about lots of the, the some of the common and reoccurring narratives from the course um, and let that help you decide how you're studying. And remember that as you're feeling this kind of imposter syndrome or, or that there might be too much to remember, remember that you're not alone in thinking that, that this guy who changed the planet and changed the way that we understand our relationship with other living things on this planet felt the same way. And so there's none of us that feel that, that don't, that avoid this feeling. And there, the trick is to just keep, keep going and get your support from those around you. So I guess uh, I'm around you on this YouTube video. So good luck and you will do fine.